past. We believe that God is writing a new chapter in your life and in mine in which anxiety is steadily diminishing and peace is constantly increasing. God has a remedy for our anxiety, a prescription. And that prescription is found in the book of Philippians, chapter 4. The words are going to appear on the screen. Some of you have the passage memorized. I invite you to say the passage out loud with me. We're working through it phrase by phrase during the summer. I hope that these words are helping you understand God's solution for anxiety. You ready? Sit up straight. Fill your lungs with air. Fill your hearts with hope. Say the words like you mean it. If you know it by memory, close your eyes and see how you do. Ready? Rejoice in the Lord always. <clears throat> Make your request known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, Lord, let these words sink into our hearts like summer rain on a dry soil bringing life. Heavenly Father, grant us the skill, the spiritual skill to deal with anxiety. We know, Lord, that anxiety comes with life, but it doesn't have to take our lives. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that we could rejoice in you, that our gentleness could be evident to everybody. We could be aware of your presence, that we could make all our requests known to you through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving in our hearts, and that we could anticipate the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, and that we would meditate upon the things upon which you want us to meditate. Thank you, Lord. Forgive our speaker. His sins are many. And help us to see Christ, just Jesus. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said, well, the next time you find yourselves discussing the unsung heroes who have saved the world, put this name on your list, Vasily Arkhipov. In 1962, Vasily Arkhipov was the chief of staff for four Russian submarines that came within a trigger squeeze of destroying the world. The four vessels were a part of the Soviet Northern Fleet. And they set sail in 1962 under the cloak of secrecy. The Soviet commanders gave each submarine captain a set of secret instructions that he was to open only at sea. The crews, the crews assumed that they were being sent on a training mission off the Siberian coast. They were to learn that they were actually directed to race 5,000 miles to the southwest to protect the city of Havana, Cuba. The next three weeks tested the resolve of the saltiest of the sailors. In order to move quickly, the subs traveled on the surface of the water and they sailed right into Hurricane Daisy. Fifty-foot waves left the men nauseated and the operating systems compromised. Then came the warm water. These subs were designed for the polar waters off the coast of Russia. They were not prepared for these tropical climates. They did not have cooling systems adequate to maintain a comfortable temperature. Consequently, some of the subs reached temperatures inside of 120 degrees. Crewmen battled the heat, claustrophobia, and by the time they drew near to the coast of Cuba, you could say they were anxious. They were troubled. There was stress then came the unexplained and cryptic instructions from Moscow not to protect the city of Havana, but to patrol, of all things, the coast of Florida 
They entered American waters, and as soon as they did, the American fleet came down upon them. On October 27th, they realized they were surrounded by a dozen American ships, and they had to make a decision. The Americans began setting off depth charges. The Russians thought they were under attack. This is when the captain lost his control. The Soviet captain of the four submarines gathered his officers in his quarters, and he made an announcement that went like this. We are going to blast them now. We will not disgrace our Navy. What the Americans did not know about these four submarines... And what I have not told you, I've been saving it for now, is that each of these four submarines carried a nuclear warhead. Each warhead sufficient enough to blow up an American city. The captain gave the command to launch the warheads just miles from the Florida coast. Had it not been... For Vasily Arkhipov, who knows what would have happened. But he spoke up. Remember, he was the chief of staff. He invited the captain to step to the side. Vasily Arkhipov is remembered as a slightly older man, soft-spoken, well-respected. He asked for a few minutes with his superior. And with all respect, he asked him to reconsider the command that he had just given. Wouldn't it be wise for us to see what the Americans have in mind. And he convinced the superior to allow the ships, the submarines, to come to the surface. And there they were greeted by the Americans. They weren't taken captive. In fact, we will never know what the Americans intended to do because within a few hours the submarines dove and were able to slip back out and go all the way back to Russia where this story was kept under wraps until 2002. And more than one historian has hailed Arkhipov as an unsung hero. The director of the National, so the National Security Archive said, the lesson from this event is that a guy named Vasily Arkhipov saved the world. Now, why do I tell you this story? You're not going to spend three weeks in a sweltering Russian sub, but you may spend three months carrying a heavy load in a semester. You may spend a difficult year sailing into the difficult winds of a difficult economic situation. You may spend months at the bedside of a sick child or an aging parent. You may spend a series of weeks battling the sense of anxiety and you will be tempted to press the button, not on a nuclear warhead, but on your anger, on your emotions. You will be tempted to release into the atmosphere a series of accusations or bitterness or anger, and you could possibly do harm to others as a result of your anxiety that has gone unchecked. I wonder how many of you have suffered at the hands of someone's unbridled anxiety. And I wonder how many disasters have been averted because somebody like this unsung hero was able to keep their calm while the rest of the world was losing theirs. The Apostle Paul has a phrase for this ability. In fact, if you'd like to fill in the blanks, we're going to look at the exhortation of Paul. He urges us to be contagiously calm, contagiously calm. Let your gentleness be made evident to all. This word gentle literally means level-headedness, clear thinking, under control, not a person of panic. The opposite would be the one who overreacts, who flies off the handle. 
The idea here is of a person who reacts in a calm fashion in a difficult season. It's a calmness, a tranquility. And the apostle says, let your gentleness be made evident to all. In other words, let your life issue a calm spirit that people notice. Don't we love the person who is contagiously calm? Just as fear is contagious, so is tranquility. And you love that person at work who always keeps a cool head while everybody's losing theirs. You love that person in the football huddle who says, now let's just settle down, guys. We'll be okay. You love that person at school who says, I know the principal's in a bad mood, but we're going to be all right. You love that person who steadies the ship, who calms everything down, who settles the family down, who settles the company down. This is the person who carries a spirit of contagious calm. Just as fear is contagious, so is faith. So I'm hoping that you'll catch a case of faith and that you'll spread it everywhere you go, this contagious calm. So where do you catch a case of calmness? Well, the apostle says you catch it as you come to understand that the Lord is near. These two phrases work hand in hand, right? Let your gentleness be made evident to all. The Lord is near. So as we come to an understanding of the presence of God, there is a calmness that happens. Oftentimes, when we find ourselves in seasons of anxiety, we assume that God is not near. Or if God is near, He doesn't care. We interpret the presence of problems as the absence of God. That's mistake number one. It's the most common mistake. When you're lying in a hospital room, when you're walking into a divorce court, when you're dealing with a season of stress, you're assuming that God is not near. That creates then a cycle of anxiety because, number one, you have the problem, and then, number two, you've got to face it by yourself. It's one thing to have the problem, but to be all alone with the problem, that makes things worse. And so a cycle, a downward spiral of anxiety is created where I've got a problem, I've got to fix it. I've got a problem, I've got to fix it. And down and down and down you go. So the apostle anticipating this says now, you be the person who has this tranquility that others notice. Let your gentleness be made evident to all because the Lord is near. You're the one who says, well, God's with us. God's still here. Uh, my friends have left. My health has left. My youth has left. But my God has not left. It's this resolve, this belief that I'm going to trust the presence of God. I think this is why that theme of God's presence is so pervasive in the Bible. I mean, we're barely into the book of Genesis, and we're seeing God come and walk in the garden with Adam and Eve. We're hearing comments like this from God to Abraham. God said, do not be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield, your exceedingly great reward. When Hagar and her son Ishmael were banished from Abraham's land, an angel told her, don't be afraid, God has heard. When Isaac was expelled, God said, don't be afraid, I am with you. When Jacob was afraid, God said, don't be afraid to go to Egypt, I will make you a great nation there. Over and over we see this theme, don't be afraid, I am with you. To Joshua, God said, do not be afraid, don't be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. This is the recurring theme. And isn't this the announcement of Bethlehem? Where God became flesh. He took on the name Jesus Christ, but he also said, and you can call me Emmanuel, which means God with us. His nickname is God's in the neighborhood. God is with us. God is next door. And then before his crucifixion, he said, I must leave so that the Holy Spirit can come. And the Holy Spirit will not only be near you, he will be where? In you for all time. So central to the promise of God is this theme that you will never be where God is not. Would you receive that right now, please? Just let that sink down in your heart and tell yourself, I'll never be where God is not. No matter where I go, 
no matter how frightening the flight might be, no matter how dark the hospital room might be, no matter how quiet the room might be, I am never where God is not. God is there. Now, you just kind of let that sink in. Let that become a defining part of who you are. The psalmist said, the Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Once you realize that the Lord is with you, that, that's a game changer, right? That changes everything. God's message is the same. It's not up to you. Now, what's interesting is how easy it is for us to miss this message. And I think that is the point of one of my favorite stories in the Bible, and that is the story of Philip. So we're moving from Paul's exhortation to Philip's calculation. Calculation. Philip is the fellow in the Bible who counted the coins, but he didn't count on Christ. Here's his story. He was there the day that Jesus told the disciples to feed thousands of people. It's in the book of John. Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But he said this to test him, for he himself already knew what he would do. This was a crowd we're later to read of 5,000 men plus women and children. If you're watching the game tonight uh, that has teams that don't include the San Antonio Spurs, but look around, you'll see 15,000 people in that arena. That's about how many people were standing before the disciples. They had anxious faces. They had growling stomachs. So Jesus turned to the disciples and said, where are we going to get food to feed these people? He specifically spoke to Philip, and he did this to test Philip, to develop a skill within Philip, to reveal something to Philip about Philip. Why Philip? Well, Philip seems to be the calculating guy. He's the bottom line pragmatist. He's the fellow who always consulted the resources and made the decisions because we know this because of what he said. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that everyone may have a little. 200 denarii. One coin was called a denarius, so this is plural for, denari for denarius. So 200 denarii is not enough. Where did he get that number? I don't know. Could be he just pulled it out of the air. Or it could very well be that's how much money they had. That he went and he looked in the purse and he said, well, okay, we got 200 coins. That's not going to get us very far. And so when Jesus says, now where are we going to get the food to feed all these people? Philip, the pragmatist, goes and he looks in the bank account. He opens the purse. He opens the wallet and he counts the money. He looks to the resources that they have and he says, we don't have enough. His friends agreed with him because according to Matthew, all of the disciples got together and they came to Jesus and they said this, now send the crowds away. Send them away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves food. Tell them just to leave. We can't solve this problem. Send them away. How respectful does that sound to you? They don't say, Master. They don't say, We have a suggestion. They don't say, well, we've discussed it. We do have one idea. They come to him in mass with a very grumpy spirit, at least it seems to me, and they say, now here's what you need to do, Jesus. And they tell the Son of God how to handle a problem. Send them away. Tell them to get lost. We've looked at our provisions. We've looked at the problem. There aren't enough provisions to to handle the problem. So take this problem and tell them to leave. If we could interview Philip, I would like to ask him one question. I would say, Philip, on that day in which you were responding to this question from Jesus, did it ever occur to you to ask Jesus to help? Did it ever occur to you to say, well, Jesus, where shall we get food? I don't know, but I bet you do. 
I bet this isn't a problem. Did it occur to you to take this problem and give it back to Christ and just say, would you mind helping us solve this? Because by this point in their history with Jesus, they had seen him do some remarkable things. I made a list of what they have seen. By this point, they have seen Jesus heal lepers, heal the centurion's servant, heal Peter's mother-in-law, calm a violent sea, heal a paralytic, heal a woman who had been sick for 12 years, raise a girl from the dead, drive out an evil spirit, heal a demon-possessed man in a cemetery, cast an evil spirit out of a boy, change water into wine, heal a man who had been an invalid for 38 years. And these are just the things we're told. Do you think that would be a reasonable question to ask Philip? Philip, you've seen all of these things. Did it occur to you or any of the apostles to say, well, hmm, what if we go ask Jesus to handle these people? Maybe he has a solution that we have not seen. The stunning answer is that not one of the disciples asked Jesus for help. He was standing right there. They could reach out and touch him. They could talk to him. They could kneel before him. They could ask him questions. But not a single one of them asked Jesus for help. Instead, when they had a problem, they, instead of consulting Christ, counted their coins. And they counted one, two, three, four. We've got 200 of them here. That's not enough. This problem cannot be solved. The maker of the heavens and earth is standing right here. And yet they're counting their coins. Sometimes you just got to think Jesus, it was all he could do to control himself. Well, a boy shows up with a basket of food. And so Jesus just takes over. Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat. About 5,000 men were there, and they took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them, and they filled how many baskets? Twelve baskets. How many apostles were there, by the way? Hmm with pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. I wonder if every apostle got a souvenir basket <laughs> that day to take home, a basket full of the food they said they did not have. Not one penny was spent. They started the day with 200 coins, ended the day with 200 coins. Turns out that Philip's formula was inaccurate. Turns out that Philip forgot the first thing that Philip should have done, but we learn a lesson as a result, and that is your first step when you have a problem that's bigger than you, consult Christ. Consult Christ. Here's the application. Begin with God. Begin with God. Now, you're not, you're not feeding 15,000 people, but you may have a deadline in about two days that's got you sucked under. You're not feeding 15,000 people, but you may be dealing with a cranky boss or a job situation that's impossible. You're not feeding 15,000 people, but you may be married to someone who's in hormonal free fall or to a man who can't resist temptation. You may be dealing with an issue in your family that you cannot solve. Some of you have been carrying and facing a problem all your life. And right now, please hear me, right now, the Holy Spirit is saying, I will carry that if you'll bring it to me. I will help you deal that with that. You were not made to carry that problem by yourself. You were not made to bear that burden by yourself. I will help you carry it if you will give it to me. 
I can think of only one possible way that Philip could have correctly answered that question from Jesus. Where are we going to get food for all these people? And that is, I don't know. I really don't know. But I know this. I know you can. I have seen what you can do. I have seen what you can create. I, can, I have seen the way you can talk to a storm and call forth the dead. I have seen you at work, and I'm going to trust you. You tell me what to do, Jesus, I'll do it. There is a bakery down the street. I don't know. Maybe they can do something. You send me there, do the work, I'll collect it. But I'm going to trust you because I don't think you would give me a job without giving me capacity to do it. You tell me to do it, then I believe you're going to make provisions, and I'm going to trust you for those provisions. I think had Philip said that, he would have passed the test. Is God testing you? What's your problem? What are your provisions? Do you have a problem that is greater than your provisions? If you do, now you know what to do. Rather than say, I don't have the provisions for the problem. I don't have patience for the people. I don't have wisdom for the question. I don't have a solution for the challenge. Rather than focus on what you don't have, turn your attention to the one person who is near. And let your gentleness be made evident to all. Because God is near. Our first response in a season of anxiety is to say, Lord, make me aware of your presence, and I trust you. And when we do that, who knows, we may go home with 12 baskets of blessings that we didn't know existed. Amen? Lord, would you please help us to receive your teaching today in such...